Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ISSA webinar for September 19th, How to Address Privacy Needs Across the AI Tech Stack. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Margaret Toscano with ISSA International, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I'd like to thank our team in the Privacy Special Interest Group for their efforts in setting up today's meeting. If you are not a member of ISSA International, please visit our website at issa.org to learn more about the benefits of membership and consider joining today. We'd like to encourage you to ask questions of our speaker today. To ask a question, please go to the top right-hand corner of your screen where you'll see a question icon. Type the question in the question area, and we will be monitoring those questions throughout the presentation. So um, we'll ask where appropriate, and then we will also have a Q&A segment at the end of the presentation where we, we will address the questions. Uh, we would like to encourage you to share your insights that you hear on social media by using the hashtags that you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner of some of our slides. Uh, after today's event, the presentation slides and a recorded version of the webcast will be available on the ISSA web conference page. And you will also be given the opportunity to print a viewing certificate on Bright Talk that you can submit for continuing education credits. Now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Scott Giordano. Scott is an attorney with more than 25 years of legal technology and risk management consulting experience. He is an IAPP Fellow of Information Privacy a CISSP and a CCSP. Scott was most recently the general counsel of Spirion, a privacy technology firm. During his career, Scott has held senior positions at several legal technology firms and is listed as co-inventor on a patent entitled Intelligent Searching of Electronically Stored Information. Additionally, he has taught the first law school course anywhere on electronic evidence and e-discovery. Scott is a member of the bar in Washington State, California, and the District of I'd like to welcome Scott. Scott will begin by giving a brief overview of the Privacy SIG Group, and then he'll introduce today's guest speaker. Scott, thanks for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. I'm very excited about our discussion today. For those of you that are new to the ISSA Privacy SIG, uh, the SIG's mission is to provide timely and relevant privacy thought leadership to InfoSec professionals. And the SIG hosts monthly webinars that dig deeply into all things privacy, but from an InfoSec perspective. Our two goals, uh, one, help the InfoSec community appreciate the differences and similarities between privacy and security and how to collaborate in order to best serve our employers, our customers, and indirectly the public. And then secondly, we also want to create and support local chapter privacy six. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Patrick Walsh. Patrick Walsh has 20 years of experience building security products and enterprise SaaS solutions. Most recently, he ran an engineering division at Oracle, bringing productivity and insights to the world's largest companies. Now Patrick leads IronCord Labs, a technology platform that helps businesses get back control of their data so they can meet increasingly stringent data protection requirements. Um, Patrick, before I go over to you, um, I would like to start with a poll. Um, we're just going to do one poll, but I did want to get that off the ground. So uh, you should see that coming up into your browser in about a minute. Um, so basically, we're going to be asking about your respective role, security professional, security team member, engineering team member, product manager, or other. So um, do uh, answer the poll, and um, then we will go right to Patrick and get fired up. Uh, thanks for that intro, Scott. So this talk will be a very fast tour of AI, the data in AI, where it flows, where it's stored, and where the privacy risks lie. We'll follow that with a discussion between Scott and I on how the rubber meets the road for privacy professionals. And the first thing to know and understand about any of this is that these systems, these AI systems, are hungry for data, and they consume a lot of it. The risks around these systems are very real. So let's start with one that many of you have probably already seen. Google told its employees not to use chatbots, including its own barred chatbot, 
because of worries about sensitive data flowing to these systems and how the data is stored and potentially used later. And regulators are drafting regulations furiously. We don't know where they'll all land exactly, but you can bet you'll have a care of duty for the data going through these AI systems and feeding them. And that means making sure anything your company builds or uses is both secure and private by design and by default. And ditto for any third-party systems you may be evaluating, right? So things have been fast and loose in this field at the expense of security and privacy as people are rushed to develop and expand and, and embrace these new capabilities, which makes a lot of sense. Don't get me wrong. Now, the main players in this area are getting hit with lawsuit after lawsuit around privacy because of how fast and loose they've been building. And a lot of that is so far focused on people's personal data being used to train these large models. But there's a lot more surface areas here than just that. And third parties are often doing a lot more with your data than you may suppose. So Microsoft's OpenAI service, for instance, funnels prompts and responses to abuse detection systems that hold them for 30 days, and that see human review of both prompts and responses, unless you take steps to qualify to remove the monitoring, if you even qualify for it. And OpenAI also monitors inputs and outputs, even for enterprise accounts, with the data flowing to unspecified contractors who I presume are in low wage countries, though I don't know that for sure. So with OpenAI, you can request zero data retention if you qualify for it. But then you might find yourself unable to see your own history for your own purposes, right? So there's a lot of hard decisions around a lot of this stuff and how it works today. As with any privacy control, you need to know what data flows where, who can and does see that data. You probably also need to be able to remove specific data by request or at the end of a retention period, just like you would for any other personal data. And you need data protection controls all of which begs a lot of questions, which we'll tackle next. But first, let's zoom out for just a minute and set the stage for a discussion of these systems. So AI is really just like any computer program. It's not that mysterious. It takes some inputs, it processes them, and it generates outputs. It's just another set of tasks that are reduced to math and then calculated. What's new and different with AI is that we understand what's happening inside the box less than we do with other sorts of programs because it happens in two phases. The first phase takes note of how things are associated with each other. And the second phase uses what was learned in the first phase to make conclusions about new inputs. And this is interesting to us because it's very familiar. Our brains aren't just calculators, but are pattern matchers that can see and classify and draw connections between things as well. But in the AI world, we like to rename everything and have extra jargon. So that first phase takes a training set as input. It trains a model, which is sort of like the brain of the AI. And then in the second phase, we give the model a prompt and we get back an inference of some kind. So machine learning, to step back even further, has actually been around for a very, very long time. The first systems were built in the 50s and the systems were already pretty good for certain tasks by the 90s. Support vector machines were a big breakthrough for classification systems, but to this day, we use the Bayesian systems of the 60s for a lot of AI-related problems. And now, that said, things really turned a corner and heated up a few years ago in 2017 with a paper out of Google on something called Transformers, which is a way of building models with a lot of extra context fed into every piece of information. So all those associations it can do become way richer for it. Now, when I started, and up to the last couple of years, building ML systems, because I've been doing it for some 20 years now, it was all ML is machine learning, AI and ML, I sometimes use interchangeably, sorry about that. When I started, it was all about the model. The trained associations in it are the decision center of AI, but they can be very sensitive to their input data and they can unintentionally retain associations that you wouldn't want them to have. So when we were building these systems, 95% of our time was spent building the model, testing the model, tuning the model, tweaking it, refining the training data, trying to find the training data that was poisoning the model in bad ways we didn't anticipate and clean that out and again and again and again. And then in addition, we had to figure out parameters and weights. And, and so, so much of our time, all of our effort really was centered around building, maintaining, upgrading, improving the models. 
In 2005, for example, I was part of a team using AI to automatically categorize web pages for the purpose of web filtering products for security. We trained on thousands and thousands and thousands of actual web pages that humans had reviewed and pre-classified. Then we'd test the model, we find it. If we were getting bad results for some category, we'd go try and find our training sets and figure out why, maybe tweak some parameters and try again. And the training data, it had to be pristine. When a page kind of covered multiple categories, it would confuse things. It would lead to bad results for us. And the messy real world data produced muddled outputs that were often difficult to track down and fix. It was very hard to see like, why did it get this result bad? You had to do a lot of work on to figure out that because of that two-step process, it basically breaks the connection between the original training inputs and the final outputs. I'll come back to that because it actually doesn't fully break it, but it does make it harder to track down. It's like garbage in, garbage out, if you've heard that expression. And so we spent a lot of our time on the original input, the training sets. Now, when building AI systems in this way, you end up putting all of your intellectual property, all the private data into those training sets, okay? And then infusing it into the model. For many years, we understood the privacy risks really just to be centered around that training data. If that data was private, then controlling that data mitigated all of the privacy risks. But more recently, we've come to understand that actually the privacy risks aren't solely in the training data itself. As AI has been leaping forward, so too have the attacks on AI systems. In the last few years, we've learned about things like membership inference attacks and model inversion attacks, where training data whether it's photos or text, names, healthcare diagnoses, and so much more, can actually be extracted back out of a model if those things were originally inputs to the model. So now if someone can query the model, then they can probably extract and steal the sensitive data used to make the model. And they can clone the model itself too, which is its own concern that we won't get into today. Now, there are lots of ways to deal with these problems including by trying to minimize the private data or the risks around that data in the training sets itself. And there are a lot of approaches to this issue that remove personal information from the training set. For example, the training data can be scrubbed, it can be redacted, it could be actually built out of synthetic data, or you can use differential privacy techniques, so on and so forth. A lot of solutions exist in the market today really to deal with the problem of if you're building your own models, how can you make sure you're not leaking personal information that could be sensitive or problematic through to a model that might get through to a malicious actor? And there are ways to mitigate threats to the model and the extraction there too, if there's still sensitive data in it, like if you have to put that sensitive data in to make it useful. And these solutions attempt to prevent the extraction of the data by monitoring queries or checking code or even encrypting the model. On the monitoring the query side, oftentimes it's done in, a, in such a way as to to try to detect when someone's cre using creative prompts to maybe to get around your own guardrails or things like that. That's sometimes called an AI firewall. There's a whole bunch of stuff around here, but that tends to be more of the cat and mouse reactive side of uh, approaching these problems. Okay, but so far we've been talking about how this has historically worked. People are still building their own models and will continue to do so, particularly for existing projects and applications that are already running and working. But for new projects, we have new approaches to solve the same problems. It's totally new ways we can, we can do the exact same things. It's a totally new ball game. What we have now is generative AI and artificial general intelligence or AGI. We have these models that have been trained on enormous amounts of data, taking into consideration huge amounts of context for each bit of data that they look at. And these are what we call large language models or LLMs and large vision models and on and on for specific purposes, like for code and for language translations and for things like this. So we have these now shared models that are generally intelligent and that are kind of like public utilities. Others make them. Generally speaking, we're not making our own. We just use them. And for something like 90% of the use cases that we used to have for machine learning or for artificial intelligence, we no longer need to train our own models. In classifying web pages, for example, instead of building my own model like we had to do and we spent developer man years on, I can just ask one of these large language and large vision models to process what's on a web page and then ask it to reduce the content to semantic meanings and categorize it. No training required. 
I, well, no specific targeted training required. So as an example, uh, going back to that web filtering product, I took a snippet from Bankrate's homepage and I asked GPT 3.5 to pick a category for it from one of 11 that I provided as options from news to sports to finance. And it nailed it. First try. This is called zero shot classification because no custom training is required. This would have just saved years and years of time and effort back in the day. But if we're using these general shared models, you might wonder, how do we get results specific to us and to our data, right? What we actually care about is insights on our business, our customers, our patients, our personal life, whatever. Can we use these shared models and still meet those use cases? Or do you have to build your own? In fact, in most cases, yes, you can use the shared models. And this is where we get into totally new tech stacks. Or they're not, not, I shouldn't necessarily call them new tech stacks, but newly popular tech stacks perhaps would be a better way to say this. So remember the outputs after you give some input to a model is called an inference. Customizing the inferences coming from these shared models can be done in two different ways. The first is to take a general model, like a GPT model or whatever, and layer on some sensitive data in a process called fine tuning, where you essentially add extra training material after the fact, after the model has been built. And this can work, but like other model training, it doesn't stay very up to date, it suffers from all of the previous training, testing, and most importantly, privacy problems. And the model can still hallucinate answers too. I assume most of you have heard of how confident AI systems give out answers, even if they're completely and totally made up that we sometimes call hallucinating. Anyway, most of the time you can actually get results that are just as good as you would get and even better with fine tuning without all the hassle of messing with the model at all. So the second approach is to add a memory to the AI system to complement and work with the model in the AI pipelines. You augment the model with recollections of things it or another complementary model has seen before. So now the memory can hold patient histories, browser histories, chat histories, purchasing histories, information about previously seen images or documents, and so on and so forth. Anything a model can understand, it can produce an impression of, a memory of, for later use. It works like this. You take your private and confidential data, some of which we might previously have used as training data, and some of which might be just internal documents or, or financial projections or roadmaps, whatever, anything. We pass it through a model, and then we store the model's impressions. These impressions are called embeddings or vector embeddings in the AI jargon, and they're what, what goes into this AI memory for later recall and use. So this memory, which is essentially an array of numbers called a vector embedding, gets stored into a newish type of database called a vector database, which is optimized to deal with large amounts of these vectors of numbers. These databases are then used for facial recognition, for voice recognition, for recommendation engines, prediction engines, similarity searches like semantic search and image search. They're just extremely powerful tools especially when combined with generative AI and general purpose models. So they're also a major new bit of infrastructure and data that just comes with a ton of privacy risk. And there are a lot of these cropping up now with hundreds of millions in VC and venture capital funding pouring in to these companies this year so far. Quite a few of these are dedicated, meaning they exclusively deal with vector data and are built specifically for the problems of AI data and memory. These are, these are tools like Weviate and Pinecone and Chroma and so forth, Quadrant. But a number of existing database solutions from Postgres to MongoDB to, to search solutions like OpenSearch and Elasticsearch have also added vector capabilities. So even if you haven't spotted your developers bringing new databases into the fold, watch out for them storing new types of data and leveraging plugins or new features for this data in existing infrastructure. As an example of how these memories and these vector databases can be used, let's look at something called retrieval augmented generation or RAG, which is a way to ground a large language model so it doesn't just make up plausible answers and so it can instead be truthful and even cite its sources when it answers questions, which is amazing, right? In addition, this provides a way to ask a model about private data that it wasn't trained on. 
Essentially, you find all the content that relates to a particular question, you retrieve it, and you feed it along with an optimized prompt to the large model, which then produces a response based on that context that it got from its memory. With a RAG workflow, there's no hallucination. The team building the AI system doesn't have to waste a minute on training a model or figuring out how to worry about the private data inside the model. But there is another fly in the ointment here. Although this data looks like a bunch of numbers instead of names and birth dates, do not be fooled. Much like training data can be pulled out of models, source data can be pulled back out of these embeddings using something called an embedding inversion attack. There are also membership inference attacks and other attacks that are emerging. Never mind, never mind the fact that an attacker can use these tools to quickly comb through terabytes of information to find the juicy nuggets that they want to steal. These inversion attacks are able to recover up to 92% of the original source data, including names, medical diagnoses, etc. So if you leave this presentation understanding nothing else, it should be this. Those vectors, those, those embeddings, Though they don't look too meaningful to a human, you look at them, they're a bunch of numbers. They hold tremendous amounts of information that can be extracted by a computer. They're a bit like your memory or mine in that they don't store the original, but they store an impression of it. But that impression is rich and detailed and reversible. And as it happens, those attacks may not even be required because for performance reasons, vector databases often store the exact inputs along with the vectors or in some cases, they store metadata related to the vectors, which may be sensitive in and of itself. This associated data can write along with these vectors and save an attacker a bunch of steps in, the, in, in pulling out all the good stuff. So when you consider the security and privacy implications of these systems, you'll want to look carefully at everything that flows through them. Okay, let me summarize so far. With these new AI capabilities, we have all new ways to build AI systems whether they're recommendation systems or chat systems or whatever. They enable new use cases, sure, but they also unlock new ways to achieve the old use cases. And they come back, they come with new tech stacks, new infrastructure like vector databases. And most importantly, from a privacy perspective, new types of data with new storage repositories. So as a privacy professional, as I'm assuming many of you are, you will need to track, trace, and to secure all of this if your AI system is operating at all with confidential data. All right, when it comes to this memory, whether you store it locally in your own data center or with one of the many mushrooming vector database as a service providers, you can protect the data by encrypting it without sacrificing the ability to use it. At the moment, Iron Core Labs, that's my company, is the only company with a solution to protect the confidentiality of this new class of AI data. So do you need that memory privacy? What about that model privacy? You should probably secure all these pieces regardless of how you use or build systems, but let's spend a moment covering the options for deploying these systems. Each of these pieces from running models to running vector databases to running applications presents questions on how to host them. Managed services are great because they make most of the operational problems someone else's concern. And for multi-tenant solutions, it can be both fast to integrate and launch with and also much cheaper. Or you can run your own models on dedicated infrastructure that you control in Amazon or Google or Microsoft Clouds. Or, or if you want to run big models, you'll need huge amounts of CPU and GPU and memory, and you'll have to engineer failover and stay on top of changes to models, et cetera, which is fine, but there are some big taxes there. And finally, you could just buy your own servers old school and do the same thing there, right? So you have lots of options for how to dealing with this stuff. And the trade-offs, generally speaking, are speed of development and ease of maintenance versus privacy and control. Though you may still want solutions for higher security and data protection, even if you're doing on-prem. But when you bring the proper encryption and data protection to bear, or you use confidential computing services and such, it changes the equation. Suddenly, you can run quicker, that is to say, develop quicker, possibly probably save money, and then make decisions about how you build or use tools purely based on time, effort, and cost considerations. In other words, these privacy solutions can help, in many cases, empower the business to make decisions based on the needs of the business without the shackles of privacy and security constraints, which is pretty cool. Okay, so in summary, 
to keep your data, your private data, private, protected, and who can access the data clear, you want to secure these AI systems three ways. First, you need to secure the model and access to it. Second, you need to secure the memory, meaning the vector embeddings, and who can make sense of them. And third, you want to lock down the interactions between these elements and the parent application, if necessary. And that's it. We have a lot more. Oh, and, well, let me, let me talk <laughs> for a moment about next steps and what you can do if you're a privacy professional. The first thing is you have to figure out what your policy is around these AI systems. That is basically, you know, how is AI data different or not from other data you have? And we recommend that you build privacy policies that cover this new AI data and the flows of that data, just like you would pretty much anything else. Just make sure you're expressly covering vector databases. Second is governance. When it comes to governance, it's a lot about asking the right questions. You know, what data inputs were used to create embeddings? Because you can't just look at the embeddings and tell like you might in a, in a classic database. You can't just look at it and tell if it's sensitive. You're going to have to ask the question, is your team able to handle data retention policies and user erasure requests and all that stuff if it might apply, right? Those are the important questions to ask here and to make sure that you get right if you're building the systems or even if you're using the, a third party with these systems. And then finally, you know, you have tracking systems for, for tracking sensitive data, like for, for tracking your, your compliance in particular, and you can treat this like other data sources. It isn't that mysterious. It's just, it's just new and scary because it's new sometimes for some of us, but if you treat it like you would treat anything else, it's going to be much the same. Now, we're doing a lot of work to try to educate folks on a lot of things here. And if you're interested in learning more about this and beyond what Scott and I will discuss next as well, we have some video tutorials up on the Iron Core Labs YouTube page. We have a security of AI landscape video that goes more in depth on different areas of solutions, naming companies and so forth that are providing different types of solutions in the, across the space. We have uh, details on protecting sensitive data and gen generative AI systems. And then we have some explainers also in more text format and blog format uh, on our website in the resources section, such as uh, information about embedding inversion attacks, what that is, what it looks like. We've done a lot of tests using these kinds of attacks ourselves to see how good it is. And it, let me tell you, it's pretty good. Um, and if you'd like to, feel free to reach out to me directly. My email address is there on the screen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, for the benefit of our audience, if you have questions, and I suspect you're going to have many, please send them in. We will get to them, I promise. Um, I have I mean, Patrick, I've reviewed a lot of your um, materials that you had on your website, of uh, all of the, the, the white papers, the, the videos, everything. And I got to tell you, the, the more I look, the more there is. And, and so my first question is put yourself in the shoes of a privacy professional or perhaps an infosec professional that's been given privacy duties. Um, and they're gonna be participating in an AI development project or maybe they're responsible for the final product. First question is, is how, how what might or how might privacy professionals um, miss AI related problems by using traditional approaches. For example, looking at a top 10 like the, um, uh, the OWASP top 10, which there is one for, for AI, but curiously, a lot of the things you just covered were not in their top 10. And that's not to denigrate OWASP, they're great, but I, I don't know what I don't know. How do, how do we approach that as, as privacy professionals? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the fundamental challenge of this space is that it is moving quickly, right? And OWASP is a phenomenal organization. I love their top 10 lists. And their top 10 list around AI is around a top 10 attacks, most of which focus on the model, few of which contemplate the newer way of building AI. It's very new. You know, these, these vector databases, like, I had heard of vector search before and vector uh, storage before, uh, but before this year, like this year, I, I, everywhere I turn, I see it, right? <laughs> it's like, it's, mm -hmm. it's really blowing up in, in a way that um, means that a lot of the things that have been the conventional wisdoms around AI systems are being turned on their ears a little bit. And so, you know, when I think of 
about this. And when I review this, like for example, if you look at my AI landscape video, I'm taking it from what solutions are in the market and then grouping them together as opposed to what specific attacks there are, um, which is a little different. But he here's what I would say to that. <clears throat> you have to understand where the data flows in any AI system that you're working with. Okay. If the, the private data flows, that is, if the private data is flowing into the model, then you have a problem around that model. That model is itself sensitive data, basically. And it, it contains mm -hmm. whatever sensitive data you populate it with, it with, whether it's health data or PII or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. If the, if the data flows into these vector embeddings into a vector database, then you have an issue there where you have to consider all of the things. Now, extracting data out of a model if there's an erasure request is really hard. You, generally mm -hmm. speaking, you have to rebuild models, although there are companies working on solutions to that specific problem. So, you know, stay tuned. I think that might get easier um, for some definition of easy. But, but the, you know, if that data is going into the vector databases, it should be much easier to remove as long as you have a way to track it and figure out which, which things have to be removed, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I think your question you know, came down to what will privacy professionals miss? Even if they're educating themselves, this, this is a fast moving area. You know, what, what is, I, and, and I, I would say the answer to that question is your developers should know. Now they might think that embeddings are meaningless and not private data, okay? Now you know better, embeddings can be reversed just like models can be reversed with these inversion attacks. And now that you know that you have to treat the data in these places that flew, that, that flowed into these places as equivalent, you know, the, the outputs are equivalent to the inputs. Understanding that you can ask all your usual questions. Where is that data? How do we deal with erasure requests? How do we, how do we track who has access to it? How do we make sure only the right people have access to it? Like it's all the same questions, right? It's just a new tech stack and, and kind of a new shape to the data. Let me follow up on something. So this idea of, of vectors, okay? So just for the benefit of the audience and other lawyers, the idea is that you're taking the inputs and you're transforming them into a mathematical equivalent, but it is not the same as creating, say, a hash in a encryption um, scenario where truly a hash cannot be re reverse engineered. This is not that case. This is taking something that is human readable, turning it into something that the computer can understand and manipulate. Yeah, this is this is like a myth that we've run into a number of times, you know, uh, even from the CEO of a vector database company I was talking to where they believe it's this one way transformation. Some people because they haven't seen, you know, I think I think the first uh, embedding attack paper that we saw was in 2020 or 2021. And so, you know, these are <laughs> everything's evolving quickly. What you have to understand is this when a model produces an embedding. It's capturing as much semantic understanding of its input as it can. You know, it's the more sophisticated the model, the more it can capture in the embedding. And it's very much, very, very equivalent to like the impressions our memories have of things. Okay. We read a sentence. We probably didn't record it word for word in our brains, but we probably, especially right after we read it, remember that sentence quite well. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the case of AI, these embeddings are exact, exactly that. It is a, um, a, a snapshot of the meaning mm -hmm. to a high degree. So, so let, me, let me go even, even deeper on this embedding mm -hmm. attack. The difference between the sentence, Bob likes Alice and Alice likes Bob is represented inside that embedding. And you know, in one, one attack paper we read, they were getting 92% recovery out of this stuff, including the exact names that went into it. And they were attacking healthcare data. They were getting names and diagnoses back out of these embeddings. So, you know, your mileage may vary as far as how much information could be pulled, but you should assume it's highly rich and effectively equivalent to whatever the inputs are. That is, that is something that, you know, I don't think the broader industry is fully educated on, but is a very much a reality today. And let me go back to something you said earlier on in the, in the presentation, because I want to make sure, again, for the benefit of the audience, say that highly personal data was used as part of the initial training set, okay, uh, or the initial, the initial set, whatever you want to call it, a training set or a test set, the, just the, the initial set where you would just start the, the entire process. 
Later, it's found that they, the, whoever built the model should not have had that data. There's really no easy way to go back and delete that. It's already, it's essentially the cake's already baked. Is that correct? Yeah, you have to understand that when, when those, the training inputs get reduced to a model, mm -hmm. everything is blended together. Mm -hmm. And so there is no way to, well, again, it's an active area of research. We'll see, you know, but I will, I will still make this, this statement pretty strongly. There's no way to extract, to, to remove, to like laser focus, remove a bit of training input mm -hmm. from the overall mm -hmm. model. It, it, saying it's been baked is right. You know, you can't get the egg back out of the bread. And, mm -hmm. and in the case of a model, that is a very apt metaphor. And so what you do instead, if you want to update your model, maybe you can add, you can layer in training data on top of it, mm -hmm. but to remove something, you got to retrain it. And, and, you know, for smaller models, maybe that's a, maybe that's a few minutes or a few hours of, mm -hmm. of computing time for mm -hmm. these large models. Mm -hmm. whoa, it can be months of massive amounts of computing power, right. To rebuild. So it is depending on how sophisticated the model is, mm -hmm. it can be extremely daunting to rebuild the model. Interesting. So then, because uh, this again, these are questions I get all the time um, in the legal in the legal realm. That if, say, for for whatever reason, a company in good faith maybe they bought a set of training data um, that was highly personal, maybe because it's it's being done for a clinical operation or something like that for a medical thing, and they did it in good faith, they find out, uh oh, they didn't have a legal right to have that for whatever reason, and now they're stuck with a model that has that data embedded in there to go and redo it basically to restart the whole process to retrain everything minus that initial data or perhaps with the correct data that sounds like that's a monumental task am i am i wrong um depends on how big the model is how but but i would say importantly if you pulled that data out it might make the model not very valuable to you at all and and, mm -hmm. and you know so you, you have to understand that the value of the model comes directly from the training data and you do all this testing on it. If, mm -hmm. And so there's two things that can happen. If, if you're removing like a piece of information, like this one person's piece of information doesn't need to be in there, you remove it. Maybe that doesn't have a big impact on the overall performance. Performance meaning uh, uh, like, like intelligence of the model. Mm -hmm. And but But if you're having to pull out a whole bunch of people your model might become kind of stupid about things that it was previously smart about, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so there's there's a couple implications here. One is, yeah, you have to rebuild the model. Depending on the the size of the model, that could be an expensive prospect uh, and a time-consuming one. And you have mm -hmm. to go through all the testing cycles and everything else to find out, did you just screw up the model? So yeah, mm -hmm. I would say if you're putting the private information into a model, mm -hmm. your challenges that you face are going to be substantially higher than if you build. It's one of the many reasons why I mm -hmm. think we're going to see people increasingly building more and more in this way where they use generally intelligent models mm -hmm. paired with private data that that can be like, you know, another advantage to this, this like the vector database approach, the memory approach mm -hmm. is that it can be updated live, right? If you want recommendation systems and there's some mm -hmm. new product, you don't want to have to wait a mm -hmm. week to see how people, what people think of the product and then feed it back in. You can be feeding in live data and giving mm -hmm. live recommendations based on the latest and the greatest, right? So depending on what kind of system you're building, these vector databases and using the general and generally intelligent models have some huge advantages over the dealing with the models yourself stuff. Hmm. So when you say generally intelligent, help, help us understand that, because that sounds like that's a different principle than, than, than upon which the current models we're using. Is that correct? I mean, no, uh, you could think of this, this general, what, what I'm calling the generally intelligent models is the umbrella for large language models, LLMs, for large mm -hmm. vision models, for these models that the companies like OpenAI and Google are making mm -hmm. in Facebook and putting out there that, that required like training on incredibly large data sets with huge amounts of computing power, taking in huge amounts of context. But what happens is once these models are trained. So, so let me, let me try and put this in better perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we used to spend some time training uh, models to categorize images. Mm -hmm. And basically it would look at an image and it would come out with like w w maybe up to three categories. It would say, oh, it's landscape. It has people in it and it has, you know, whatever. Okay. And it wasn't that, that amazing at that. It, it, it could mistake a lot of things for a lot of other things, but whatever, this is how it used to be. 
Now those vision models, they can pick out every face. They can remember the faces. They can associate them with other faces. They can pick out details about the weather, the like what objects are in the photo, what animals are in the photo, what plants are in the photo and name the stupid plants. Like mm -hmm. these are very powerful general purpose models that are large, that could be more expensive to run, but you can do so much with them that in many cases, you just don't have to build your own model. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so now you don't have to go training something on what's a cat and what's a dog. The mm -hmm. stupid general ones that anyone can use already will tell you that, right? And so mm -hmm. you can fast forward past all that stuff, whether we're talking about vision or text or whatever, you can do so much more without training the model first. That's mm -hmm. the gist. Yeah. I mean, okay. and there, by the way, there's still use cases where you're going to need to train your own model. I mean, it doesn't totally go away, but it, it, it is... There are all new ways to do a lot of the same old use cases. Okay. Let me change gears for a moment because I want to and go back into putting ourselves in the shoes of privacy and security professionals that are having to, to be involved in AI. Um, what are aspects of AI and, and data protection? What, what are they, which ones fly under the radar, so to speak? I mean, it, it's this, this presentation has been largely about that, right? Because I think, if you're generally aware of what the threats are and you're reading things like OWASP, then you're probably aware of model inversion attacks or membership inference attacks, right? I'll explain membership inference attacks briefly because I didn't, I didn't cover it in the thing, but that's where you're trying to understand if a specific piece of text or image or whatever was used in the training set. Mm -hmm. And, and this is something that like these attacks are happening every day now as artists try to figure out if open AI stole their art you know, or and, and things like sure. this, right? And then lawsuits are being generated when they figure out that they did by doing these membership inference attacks. Same thing can happen, by the way, against vector embeddings. It's the same problem. Mm -hmm. um, I feel though, at least on the model side, that the, it's generally understood now that the training data is problematic and that the model, if it used private data, could be problematic if it's not otherwise dealt with. What's not understood, I think, is these vector embeddings. The vector mm -hmm. databases are totally under the radar today and I don't think most security professionals will even realize that they probably, they may already, at least in maybe not production projects, but there are probably projects happening already where data is flowing into these vector data stores, or maybe an existing data store with a vector uh, uh, add-on of some kind. And to me, that is the biggest, like, it, it's this huge we're at kind of at this beginning stages of the sea change where soon everything will be there. But right now, as people are aggressively building new AI projects to take advantage of all these new capabilities, that's the end of the radar. Like watch out, like none of the, mm -hmm. if you have amazing products, security products that are scanning your infrastructure for where the sensitive data is cool, they probably don't look in vector databases. Mm -hmm. And even if they did, they might not be able to understand what was in there. And that's why, you know, you got to ask the right questions. Well, to your point, if I had to describe the weak links, if you will, in, in developing AI and just in AI itself, what should we, the audience, what, what should we understand in terms of what you believe is the weak link or the weakest link? Uh, you know, so that's actually not the individual systems themselves, but the cohesive whole. If you think about what these systems do for us, you know, the idea of being able to have a chat bot who I can say, hey, I'm looking for my most recent notes on this such and such topic, and I need to remember what the summary of that conversation was, and da da da, you know, and it tells me, right? Mm -hmm. Phenomenally amazing efficiency building uh, uh, capabilities here we're talking about. Now, if an attacker gets some kind of a authorization to access that same system, then they can query my whole life or my businesses mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Like if, if I'm an attacker, I, man, I'm just gleefully doing this right now because because as an attacker, it can be daunting to go through databases of information to try to find the good stuff, you know? And it can be daunting to go through terabytes of SharePoints to f try and find the, the juicy nuggets that they're going to be able to monetize as an attacker or whatever. But if I have an AI system prompt that I can go to and I can be like, hey, what are the projections for next quarter that aren't public yet? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, or whatever the sure. whatever the domain of of private data is that we're talking about. If if I can do that, think of the time it saves me as an attacker. So if 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 I'm worrying about these systems 
there's a lot of different levels to worry about them at. I would say an attacker coming in, if they can get access to the to the chat interface or whatever, the, you know, the AI program app, as much as it brings efficiency to the users, it will also bring efficiency to the attackers or it has a potential mm -hmm. to do that. Sure. One final question before we go over to the audience questions. And audience, if you have more questions, send them in. I see them coming in here, so please do send them in. One final question here is, say that I'm being put onto an AI project as a, an infosec or, or, or privacy professional, and I want to build my own checklist of things to go through to make sure that I haven't missed anything or just, just to make sure I'm being methodical. Is there a way to kind of bootstrap things that are perhaps already out there, or, or how would I approach that? Yeah, so um, I think we have some more content to create around this. I, I will say that in terms of looking at third-party services, we have some good content. Maybe I'll uh, try and figure out a way to post that to everybody here soon. The um, it is so so. Look, there's two parts to this. One, a lot of this stuff is in the cloud. Whether you're doing it as a developer level or at a higher level, a lot of the stuff is using third-party services. Vetting those third-party services should work like it always has. You need to make sure you understand how they're able to deal with the private private data that may be flowing to and through them. And not only that, but all the all the other aspects of erasure and governance and you know audit trails, et cetera, need to be in place for those third-party services. So you have to ask the right questions of them gauge their security, gauge their level of maturity on the security side. I think that's incredibly important. Um, in terms of checklists here, I really think it's going to be almost the same checklist you would otherwise have. What data is being used in these systems? Where is it flowing? Who has mm -hmm. access, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But you got to make sure in case your developers aren't aware that embeddings, for example, are, are private data if they were derived from private data that you're asking specific questions about. And what about these? You know, do you have embeddings? How are they being derived? From what data are they being derived? I would add that in. And, and you know, and what, what associated data, what metadata or other associated data is carrying along with them? And then where are they flowing and who can access them? You know, so it's just... Um, although there's all these new AI regulations that are coming down the pipe. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of those will be targeted at training data side of things. Mm -hmm. um, the privacy aspects of this remain pretty similar. Remember, remember that this is, these are new systems you're building. So he, here's, here's another way that you should be thinking about this. Article 25 of, of GDPR, for example, is data protection by design mm -hmm. and by default, right? Mm -hmm. These are all new systems being built. You're not building them the old ways, and you shouldn't be thinking about the security and privacy the same way you've been doing it for 15 years because you can get away with that because it's the incumbent solution. It's new. You have to design it and build it with you know, privacy built in, data protection built in. How are you going to do that? So you have to make sure you're setting the bar right for these new projects, that you're meeting that bar, that your developers mm -hmm. understand the risks of the data they're dealing with and where it's flowing and that you have your arms around those risks. Like I would say the checklists flow are all about that. Vet your vendors, make sure they're going to be able to protect it as well as you can. Watch out for the gotchas, right? Mm -hmm. OpenAI, Microsoft, they all have some gotchas and they're probably acceptable, but you best be aware of them and eyes wide open walking in, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. they're not acceptable. And so that's... Uh, that's the best I have today. I mean, I think we need to build out some better checklists for folks. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the privacy tracking and governance systems have some, have some work to do to, to help with this. Okay. Let's do this. Let's go over to the audience because we have, have some questions here. Um, I love this first one because this is exactly what I would ask. How do we deal with, with um, PII, so, uh, so personal information essentially, in AI or ML systems? So, for example, when we get a DSAR or data subject access request, um, that's a that's a tough tough question to answer. But how would you approach that if 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 you're a user of an AI system that, that incorporates personal data for whatever reason? How do you deal with DSARs? Oh, that's so hard. That's a that's mm -hmm. a brilliant question, and and it's it doesn't have any easy answers because uh, it depends. So, there's a couple different patterns here. There's a pattern in which, for example, let me let me focus on the training data. In the training data, you should be able to look through the training data and see if that user's information is in the training data if you're building your own models, okay? And if it is, then that's what you disclose. You can't look at 
well, you can, there's membership inference attacks, but you're probably not going to like, it's not really a great way to try and answer a DSR by going and running attacks against your model. So instead you're going to look at the training set because you have access to that. And, and, and then you're going to decide, you're going to, you know, release information based on that. You know, yes, this data, this, 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 and this data were used in training this model. Okay. On the embedding side. So if you're not pouring that private data into the um, training of a model, but you're using a general purpose model, then you're probably pouring that data into the, what we call them, what I'm calling the memory here, what some of the vector database companies call the memories, but, but more technically would be called those vector embeddings. It's the same thing. You're going to, if I, I'm assuming you're storing the original data as well as the derived embeddings. And if you are, then you look at the original data and that's how you give them an information, information on it. Now, if you happen to be in a situation where you're training models and then that training data might disappear or where you're creating embeddings and then the original data that was used to generate the embeddings might disappear. Well, now you have, you're not, there's no native way unless you create it. That's going to allow you to figure out what that data is anymore. I mean, except for embedding inversion attacks and you can, you can do embedding inversion attacks, but it does require a level of sophistication. You know, we had a team of developers who took some open source software from one of these papers and started applying it. It worked very, very well, but it took about a week of time building up attack models and other stuff. So it's, it's not for the faint of heart necessarily, but it's certainly doable. And I guarantee it'll be getting easier. That said, I would say, um, Hopefully they're labeling the data that comes in and what the source of the data is, a user ID maybe and mm -hmm. some other stuff so that you can quickly see, you know, worst case, you can say we have information pertaining to this person in our embeddings, but we no longer have the source data for it, but you at least you would be able to remove it. It's not the best, but that's uh, if you keep the source data, in most cases, I think people will because mm -hmm. um, it's. It, it would only really make sense that they keep the source data in most cases. Then, it, then you have to look to the source data when you when you fulfill those requests, and then know that that source data was also using these embeddings, so you can understand that it's in two places effectively. Okay. Another great question. These are all great questions coming in. So, from a day-to-day -day use of AI tools such as ChatGPT, would you agree that obfuscating data before inputting the information is key step in limiting dissemination of proprietary information? And what other steps would you take? or advise us? Well, when you say obfuscate, what I think you mean is like, there's these, there, there's a, there's a new kind of area of products that are cropping up that are trying to intercept private information that's going to these models and stop it before it goes and then, and redact it or replace it with something that's, you know, kind of pseudonymization style. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, like swap out the names for fake names or something before it goes to the model. And I think that's what you mean by the obfuscating thing. I think you're talking about these, these kind of AI firewalls, in this case, monitoring or prompt for private data so that it doesn't flow to Google or mm -hmm. OpenAI. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. there's the, the answer to that question for me is that's a cat and mouse game. If you're going to let data flow through and you need to stop private data from going, it might be the best that you have. However, there are companies building private model hosting so that you can use confidential computing and other things so you can query a model without leaking data on, in it and mm -hmm. without it getting stored, but just coming straight back to you as inference, for example, and then you can deal with it. So that's a that's another way to do it. That way it doesn't require the cat and mouse. That's more of a proactive mm -hmm. solution than a reactive one. Because on the cat and mouse side, you know, how someone phrases something and you know how it's been how the system has been tested. And a lot of a lot of folks are using AI models specifically to detect, you know, sensitive data and stuff, but they have false positives and false negatives like anything does. And, and so, um, you know, I would, I would, where, where feasible, think about using, are, is there a secure private model approach that would work? And if not, if I want to use open AI, because like GPT-4 is the best, you know, that is the leading thing, then okay. Uh, use it. And yeah, think about whether or not it's okay for data to flow through there or not, you know, consider with open AI, whether or not you want the zero retention stuff applied to your account, for example, that's an, it's an option where they never store the data. It still flows through them, you know, and you have to set your own risk levels. Uh, I, I think all of these things are, are tools in the toolkit. I don't know that it's, I, I think it's important to understand that there's a variety of tools in the toolkit and you have to pick and choose. It's not, mm -hmm. um, it's not sort of like a one-stop pattern. It definitely depends on what data is flowing into whom and what your risk and trust levels are and stuff. 
Um, another question. When you mention these attacks on models, are you referring to models available to the public like OpenAI or Google, or are you referring to models that private individuals slash companies develop but somehow left exposed to bad guys, to hackers? Yeah, so model attacks are, I mean, of course people are attacking the OpenAI models and stuff, right? The membership, I mentioned membership inference so that artists can figure out if OpenAI used their art to train it and, and, and sue accordingly and stuff, right? You know, so if, if you can query a model, through a chat bot or directly through an API or whatever, right? Then, then the, a lot of these attacks become available. If you've built a private model that's only used privately and not exposed in any way publicly, then you're not really that susceptible to those attacks. You know, uh, it, 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 is, it is a question of who can access it. But if you've built a chat model that people can query and you're hoping that the chat model is somehow applying some permissions to what data it filters back or something, you know, there's a really, really good chance that there's ways to evade that, you know? And so, so if the model if there's a way for someone to interact with the model, especially outside of your organization, but you know, even inside your organization, you have to worry about, you know, maybe only the executives are allowed to see the, the performance, the quarterly performance results, you know, ahead of it being made public if you're in a public company, right? Like there's definitely a lot of room for worry about what exactly is in the model and who exactly can extract information out of it, including insiders. So I, I would say the answer to your question uh, in a nutshell, is yeah, it, a model attack can't happen if someone can't interact with your model, mm -hmm. you know, directly okay. or indirectly. But if if you know whoever can interact with your model directly or indirectly could potentially attack your model, and you just have to decide if that's a threat that you're worried about. Okay, excellent. We have a one a little bit longer, but I, I, I it's, it's uh, these are all excellent questions. So this one is in terms of protecting the three uh, the three areas of the AI stack you mentioned earlier. Uh, how much time should you allocate to implementing future safe encryption alternatives. And I know you are you have great expertise with encryption. Here it says, um, um, my understanding is that you have previously suggested building code that is easy to refactor encryption algorithms on and um, still using RSA or AES if, ne if needed. So is this the optimal approach? So let me, um, let me explain the question maybe slightly more to the audience who might not get it. Okay. Um, I'm a big proponent of something called crypto agility, which is, and, and of as much as possible sort of developer proofing cryptography. That is to say, you take as many decisions, low level decisions away from the code and from the developers as you can. And this allows you to, if over time, change what algorithm you're using or what key strength you're using or whatever things that you might set with policy without having to have coding projects to go back and change things. The, there's a few fundamental reasons for this, uh, the biggest of which is the threat of quantum computers. Okay, Quantum computers will someday be real. Perhaps they already are in secret labs that, that are controlled by government. We don't even know, but we do know that within the next year, we're going to have a whole bunch of new algorithms that are uh, new standards that are quantum resistant. And it's going to create a sea change in how people use cryptography. Uh, I, my company provides a bunch of crypto agility solutions. We can help you with that to make it so that you build and you future proof. Um, and, and that's super important. Now, I do want to clarify that when we talk about encrypting vector embeddings, what we're doing is something called property preserving encryption. And it allows you to query over those, those wherever they're stored, you can make an encrypted query to, to match over the encrypted stored embeddings, which is super cool stuff. It is not one of the algorithms that is susceptible to quantum computers. Um, well, there's a big asterisk there. So th there's a specific kind of attack algorithm for quantum computers that would have an impact on the security of this in terms of the how long it would take to brute force things. That's super technical. Let me just say, uh, we're building such that you can make adjustments as you go. That is a core philosophy for Iron Core. It is something you should look for when you're doing encryption solutions so you can understand if the solution you're buying is crypto agile, if it'll be able to adapt and weave as, crypt as quantum computers become reality. And with that, I think we're out of time. Yes, uh, Scott, I think you might be on mute. I think you're right. <laughs> so, um, uh, Patrick, thank you, thank you for the, this hour. I'm going to turn things back over to Margaret, um, and uh, and thank you to the audience. Great questions, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
Um, just as a reminder, in case you missed my opening remarks, uh, the presentation slides and a recorded version of the webcast will be available on the ISSA web conference page. And you will also be able to print a viewing certificate on Bright Talk uh, that you can submit for continuing education credits. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at memberservices at ISSA.org. And uh, we'd like to invite you to join us for our next webinar, which is tomorrow at one o'clock uh, Eastern time. And the topic will be privilege, privilege sprawl. Yes, it applies to you. And that's hosted by our uh, sponsor, Netrix. Thanks again, Scott and Patrick, and uh, to our privacy SIG group for hosting this webinar. Thanks to our audience for joining us and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.